The story of Ugo Fiesta is by now well known. It is linked to this icon which is now venerated near Medjugorje. What happened is that he was in a depressive mode, especially with regard to his faith. He was in a wheelchair and a hopeless case. He was a loser and he felt sidelined in life, even by God. He, by divine providence, was brought to Rome and he was cared for by good nuns who spoke to him of divine mercy. And he had these images. He had one big one in front of him when he was before Pope John Paul II at the general audience. And because he was in a wheelchair, the Pope happened to be close to him while passing. And he said to him, to trust in the Divine Mercy and to pray to his Faustina. Off he went with himself and prayed at the sanctuary in the north of Italy before this icon. It's a very large one, life-size. And he was there praying for healing and he was praying intensely. And on the third day something happened. The Lord came out of the large icon. It came to life. He stepped out of it, laid his healing hand upon him, and he was miraculously healed. There is more to St. Faustina than meets the eye. I remember at Cunacrot, near here, they wanted a hymn for the new shrine to Divine Mercy that they were having built and blessed and I didn't know what to do so I just pleaded with Sister Faustina as she was at the time for inspiration and out of the blue immediately came those words and melody and they were perfect and my mother later on harmonized them. She was good at the piano. but. Faustina is for our time. There is a lot in her diary, and it's not only in the locutions given to her, but also in her own intuitions. The Lord taught her the importance directly of interiority and recollection, and indicated how he did not find rest in an extrovert soul. He did not have easy access to the noisy and bustly soul. But he had his delight in the interior and silent soul. I was moved by this intuition which is ever valid. Silence, says the saint, is a sword in the spiritual struggle. A talkative soul will never attain sanctity. The sword of silence will cut off everything that would like to cling to the soul. We are sensitive to words and quickly want to answer back without taking any regard as to whether it is God's will that we should speak. A silent soul is strong. No adversities will harm it if it perseveres in silence. The silent soul is capable of attaining the closest union with God. It lives almost always under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God works in a silent soul without hindrance. I had 
only mass today. Devotee mass of the Holy Spirit for the Synod. The Holy Spirit is hovering around church assemblies, but we know also that where there is a powerful assembly, the other powers are not dormant, and therefore we need to be aware and awake. We need to be in observant mode and serene mode, knowing that we are not God and that the Church is God's. But we need to know things and to be aware of things and also to have the taste, the sapientia, because the word sapientia, wisdom, is linked with sapore, which is taste. The taste of the things of the Spirit and the discernment of what is good and what is of God and what is not. Therefore we look to the security of two millennia and a certain humility is needed. The noisy voices may have an immediate effect. Raucous sounds can be invasive and persuasive but they're not always the tone that the Spirit uses. The Spirit of our God is a Spirit essentially of serenity and deep peace. And we need to be aware that the old saying which influenced hugely St. John Henry Newman is ever valid. Securus judicat orbis terrarum, the whole world judges securely. And therefore there is an element also of the sensus fidelium around, for the Church is more than a group in it. It is the whole mystical body, and there is also in that mystical body a divine gift, which is able to discern and to sift and to receive and not receive. And therefore God is not short of means of getting through to his people, if they are precisely in receptive mode a certain interior silence. There are certain things that we need to be aware of. The sacred is hated by the forces of hell, the priesthood especially, for it is the means by which we obtain it. All he wants is to destroy it. Now, that same Newman has a logical, calm teaching with regard to the sacraments. In moral theology, various schools were respected with regard to degrees of severity, from the rigoristic to the probabilist. There was in between the probabiliorist, the more probable. It's a question that comes up in the Ministry of Confession. If we have two interpretations which could be of equal value, one can opt. But there is one realm in which that cannot happen. It's the realm of the sacraments and the realm especially of frontal sacraments. There we have to have the tutsiorist school. Tutsior in Latin is surer, because in the frontal sacrament one has to be not 100% but 101% sure that it's valid, because other sacraments depend on it. When I was being received into the church in 1971, I was baptized sub conditione, under condition. If you're not already baptized, I baptize you, is the formula. That was at Ampleforth Abbey. Well, with regard to ordination, 
likewise a font to a sacrament, if it turns out, for instance, that a person had not received a valid baptism and is ordained, he would have to have a valid baptism and also an ordination, because the first of the two was in each case invalid. It has happened recently that there have been cases of invalid formally being used for baptism and then ordination taking place later in time and the Vatican has imposed ordination because it wasn't valid as well as the baptism which wasn't valid. With regard to people coming over from the Anglican Church and being ordained to the priesthood, even a bishop coming over is not ordained conditionally. He's not rebaptized because his baptism is valid, but he is ordained absolute. That is, there's no condition because his first ordination was omnino iritum, completely null and utterly void, as defined by Leo the Thirteenth in 1896. So, with regard to ordination, Newman points out a few things. He indicates how if one has a formula, a rite which is centuries old, one knows that it works, that valid orders pass. Referring to the Angular, Anglican formula, he indicates that that is not necessarily the case. We haven't any security. That's independent from the question of the valid orders of the ordaining bishop himself. That, when he was writing, had not yet been defined. But the formula was deficient. Actually, the Anglicans themselves realized that it was deficient, but about a hundred years later, after it had come into being, received the Holy Spirit was the simple one initially. It was added for the office and ministry of bishop, priest, deacon. But it had been lost anyway, because under Matthew Parker, the first Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury as we know it, he had been invalidly ordained by Bishop Barlow. So it didn't pass anyway. Now, the question then arises, according to Newman, with regard to the ordaining in a certain formula. The formula matters. We have to be completely secure, over the top secure, that there's no leakage, no danger, that it's watertight. He sees, therefore, that securus judicat orbis terrarum, there's only security in the massive block. Now, with regard to going out of what we know to be sure, for instance, in wanting to do something that the Lord didn't do, we are no longer obeying his command to do something, we are doing our own thing, and we can't be sure that he's going along with it. So we're going out, therefore, of the Tutsiorist school. We're going into something which is hopefully valid. But we can't be sure that it would be. And the weight of the centuries would be against it. It's the same as if one tries to ordain a Muslim. Now, if one ordains somebody under age, a minor, it actually is valid, but he may opt not to exercise the ministry. That was something that might have happened way back. But if one ordains a person, an adult, who has not baptism in his soul, it is not valid. Therefore, the vessel has to be capax. Now, according to two millennia of church teaching, East and West, and that's not indifferent either, the vessel for major orders that includes the diaconate, because it's all one order in three tiers, it has to be male. So, if one tries to ordain somebody 
who is either not baptized or not a male, one is ordaining a vessel that is not capax of holding it. So these are not questions of social skills or equal rights. The question of yes or no, does it pass? So calmly one sees, if they try to do it, one observes they're doing something exteriorly, which is what has been happening for centuries anyway in the Anglican Church, ordaining with all the signs, but it's not passing. We are not able to tell the Holy Spirit what to do. We can only be sure of having his action when we do what is secure. And therefore we have to be tutsiorist in this. The question of whether a priest or a deacon or a bishop should be married or not is a separate question and pertains to discipline. However, it's closely linked with dogma too, because the understanding in the West of the nature of the priesthood is such that it has been by the Holy Spirit placed in such a category apart that it has been understood that any hands that touch God do not touch anything less, and that the total sacrifice involved in giving oneself to the most sacred of all involves total gift and total availability. It's therefore supremely fitting that there should be this total apartness and availability, which is not there if one has a family in tow. And not only that, but as Benedict XVI pointed out, what one ends up there is not solving a problem, but creating new problems, because it's going to lead down the line to a new problem which is going to be extremely complex. Divorced priests. The wife, of course, wanting to live in the presbytery after the departure of the husband. A parish, of course, having to cope with problems at the home of the presbytery, at the priest's house, because it does matter if a priest has a serene home life or not. And also, a woman can be pretty demanding over her husband when it comes to free time, because a priest's time often nowadays, at least in the West, is important in the evening. Things happen in the evening in our society, meetings and so on, and that's the time for the family. Moreover, marriages are less stable than they were, and there can be huge problems at home which are bound to have a major impact on the quality of the priesthood of any candidate who wants to combine the two. One can argue, what about the East? Well, in the East there is a different culture, and moreover, the women who are called to be a presbytera, that's the female, the presbytera is the consecrated person helping the parish priest, that person is married to him, but has a very specific role in society and very strict rules to obey with the use of marriage, for instance, because the husband has to abstain before celebrating and in certain periods. And there are other things as well that she has to observe. She dresses in a certain way and is always recognized by the people. And she has a status in that society. And that priest would always be there until he dies in that parish. He'll never become a bishop because the bishops are always not married. Therefore, they're monks. It's a different way. And there, in that situation, the next generation also usually thinks of the priesthood. It's a succession, it's a caste. The sons of priests become priests in the East, and it carries on. It's a very different culture. And moreover, they are not given a parish, a church, unless they are married. That is to say, there is a period in their formation in the seminary when, before ordination to major orders, they have to decide. And they are told quite clearly, this is the moment. If you're not married, you cannot have a church and therefore they can opt for the monastic life if that's what they want. But they can't have the two. And so, at that point, they will look around. Now, we can't have in the West an imitation of that, such as, for instance, having a situation where you have courting priests. There, that doesn't happen. They are ordaining people who are married. They have the stability already. <coughs> it wouldn't work at all if one tries to make them free to marry after ordination, because 
that would be catastrophic for ladies looking for a priest in the presbytery. It's a different setup in the East. Moreover, in the East, the support given by the Presbytera is huge. That can be argued in the Anglican setup as well, but there has been a difference in the Anglican setup insofar as the role of the wife of the clergy, clergyman, the parson, was well defined in society up until very recently. It was referred to as the unpaid curate. She had a lot of the social element, the contact with the people, and she knew exactly what her role was, and again she was formed to it by a whole society. That is no longer the case, and now when they're ordaining women as well, you might have both the husband and the wife in orders, Anglican orders, invalid, but nevertheless working for the people of God, and the wife might be better. You have two heads, and it's not as simple as it was. You have also a situation where the wife is ordained and the husband isn't. It's very confusing. So we can't really compare the East because it's a different society. And also the respect for celibacy is still there because the bishops are always, from the monastic world, being non-married, which gives them actually very spiritual bishops. With regard to the diaconate, that discipline still applies in the West, the permanent diaconate, that they ordain stable married men for the permanent diaconate. But if that person loses his wife, he doesn't remarry. One doesn't receive another order after a major order, that is to say, marriage. With regard to another big issue, we cannot change the moral law to suit society. The Anglicans have capitulated on this one. One cannot bless a sin. One is not doing the Lord's work and there is no blessing passing. A Lord will not bless a sin. It's rather as, for instance, at Medjugorje, they might say to people, while blessing objects at the end, this blessing will not pass if any object has been stolen, because sometimes that can happen in the souvenir shops. So it is that a blessing will not pass onto a sin. Now with regard to specific sins, people who have tendencies are not given special privileges. Every person on earth is obliged to the sanctity of his state. The bottom line is, any genital use outside lawful and sacramental marriage is sinful. That applies across the board. We can't have special privileges for certain people who are exempt, and we can't bless their sin. It's just logical. Our faith is logical, and it's not our property to alter. We listen to the law of God and don't make it. So that same spirit, calmly and serenely, will whisper that to souls of goodwill. And the problem is there, is their goodwill. The Lord delights in the humble and the silent, but can't get through to the noisy and the raucous. May the Holy Spirit, the spirit of deep interiority and peace, have his sway and way, and not the loudest noise. There is a place where peace and mercy meet, where humankind, the rays of Godhead, can in darkness greet and healing find. There is a manhood where divinity looks at us. From all eternity, O stream of light, a beam of ancient grace, given in this hour, for us who in this tender face behold the power that at a time then been the moment 
Who? 